That is always very important. It's recording on my end, I see. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Liberty Radio. It is Monday, March 18th, 2024. Only four shopping days left until Skull and Bones Day. And uh, it is uh, very auspicious that we are broadcasting today because we are being joined by a best-selling author, as well as the host of the wildly popular Macroaggressions podcast, and also co-host of Day Zero and Union of the Unwanted, and to boot, a successful entrepreneur in his own right. He's as comfortable smoking a joint with your anarchist buddy as he is talking strategy with a future number one draft pick. And, you know, he'll probably teach them both a little something in the process. Of course, I am talking about the one and only Charlie Robinson. Charlie, welcome to Liberty Radio. Well, thanks for having me. I forgot the skull. Here it is, almost Skull and Bones Day, and I forgot to get you something. Oh, that's all right. Like I said, you still have a few shopping days left. Right. So, so there's plenty of time uh, to Small, rectify that error. Medium or large sized coffin. Which ones do we, do we want for skull and bones day? Well, I was just watching the, uh, the Trevor, uh, <laughs> the Trevor skit where he goes in <laughs> to the kids. Right. And he's explaining to them about skull and bones. That always cracks me up. Yeah. I actually played that on Saturday night uh, in anticipation of the upcoming holiday. Cause again, everybody always remembers the Ides of March, right? Because we have the, the famous historical event tied to that particular date. If again, we're supposed to believe that any of that is true, but they always gloss over the holiday the following week, which is uh, 322 skull and bones day. So uh, I just, uh, you know, take it upon myself to make sure that we point that out to folks. Thank you for keeping it keeping them honest and, and keeping skull and bones relevant. Shall we never forget? Exactly. So why don't we just jump into what it seems like everyone in independent media has been talking about over the weekend. That of course is the brand new investigative series that was released on Netflix this month. I, I guess also in anticipation of skull and bones day, although I haven't gotten any confirmation on that. Have you yourself had a chance to check out uh, the American Conspiracy series uh, on the octopus murders yet? I have. I watched all four of them in one sitting. Oh, wow. So what were your impressions of the story that they told? Well, I didn't... I, I don't... I can't say I, I... I can't say I learned something that I didn't really know i but but i'm probably the worst person to use as a barometer for this because i was also 44 years old writing a book about the octopus same as danny casalero so of course i'm going to have a bit of overlap hoping that i'm not getting packed into some bathtub in west virginia someplace so i'd been aware of the story for a long long time and my book the octopus of global control isn't necessarily about the same octopus that Danny Castellaro was hunting. I think that um, if I were to put a, I'd put a different label on his, I wouldn't call it the octopus. I'd call it the enterprise because it was George HW Bush's group, the enterprise that was the ones that killed Danny Castellaro for, for the reasons laid out in the, in, in the book. So then it's just a, it's more just a matter of, of terminology. They mentioned that a little bit. And I mean, they showed, some of the org chart of the enterprise, they had a couple names on there. They should have, I mean, they could have, I should have, but they could have devoted an entire episode to the group that was responsible for his death. Of course, they didn't do that too much. But I I do um, look, it's a good reminder that these people are super dangerous and they don't care about you. And there's hundreds of people that wound up in a similar manner to Casalero, whether it be packed into a, a bathtub or exploded in an airplane or 
hanging from um you know or, or if you're you're somebody like um uh Terrence Yankee from o- Oklahoma City you get uh, assaulted in your car dragged 2 miles away beaten to death and then they label that a suicide so i mean you there's a lot of ways to to, to do it and um i'm glad look i'm glad they i'm glad that the normies out there are getting a taste of Danny Castellaro um, because, you know, it's funny because he wasn't really a conspiracy writer. He was a tech writer. He just right. kind of got got into this because as a tech writer, he was writing about software. He was ri- writing about the in- Inslaw and the Promise software and all these these things. And because you wind up writing about that, you fall into this rabbit hole. And as a result, he, he wound up by default becoming sort of a conspiracy writer, but a it, it it wasn't really his bread and butter. Um, but these things have a tendency to get under your skin when you see organized crime masquerading as governments. It makes you want to blow the whistle on it and it makes you want to talk about it. It makes you want to uh, make it difficult for these guys to to continue their their reign of terror. But but I don't think he had any idea who this group was. I mean, this is the most dangerous group in the world. I mean, they will, they will blow you up to send a message to a dozen other people that, so that they don't have to blow them up. But you know what I mean? But this is, this is the private CIA. You know, this is a group that is, that is unbound by laws. It's like, what would you do if you could do anything and never go to prison for it? That's what these guys had been doing. And I think when you stumble across this, you have sort of like the the same reaction that most people have, which is like, it is a conspiracy that is so massive that you you almost can't believe that it could possibly be real because for this many people to be involved in it, surely somebody would have had to have talked. Somebody would have spilled the beans on this. And then what you find is that, well, there were people that were spilling the beans on this, and they wound up as piles of bodies. And and um, and this is a group that has has had been doing this. You know, the average person doesn't really know the octopus or Danny Castellaro, but they know about the savings and loan scandal, and they know about Iran Contra, and they know about cocaine being flown in to the United States and the crack ep- epidemic. They know about the private prison industry. Well, then you know about the enterprise and you know about the octopus. If you know who these, what these events were and you know who the people that were behind it, that's who this group is. So, you know, Netflix did what what they kind of always do, which is, you know, they went, they went some distance, but never quite enough for for my liking but of course i'm you know i want everything out i am of the belief that if you are somebody that is holding secrets like danny casalero or a filmmaker who has the goods and, and chooses not to put it in you really only have two choices the though you you may believe that you have three choices but you you really only have two your choice is tell Everything that you know about this immediately to as many people as you can tell, be as up, up front and as public with it as you can be. Let it all out of the bag immediately. That's option number one. Option number two is when you find out about this, you never say anything to anybody ever for as long as you live and you take it to the grave with you. Those are your two options. The third option is the option that will almost always get you killed. That is when you know the information and you make a comment that I have information that I may or may not put out, that will get you killed. And that is, of course, what happened with with Danny Castellaro and a number of other people, journalists and, and people that weren't journalists, people that were close to it. It's that in-between stage that's the most dangerous. So if you're sitting on good, you know, and we joke about it with Hillary, you know, this person must have had information that would lead to the arrest of Hillary Clinton. Ha ha ha. But we're only half joking because the truth is that with the Clinton stuff, same thing, same, same rules apply. Let everybody know about it or don't let anybody know about it. But you tease that like you're about to drop a new album and it, it's coming out and get ready and all that. Ooh. 
boy, man, the, the history is littered with things ending very badly for people that did that. Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, tying the, the Clintons into everything, that's really, in my opinion, just an extension of the Bush yeah. enterprise, right? Because yeah. you, can, you can go back and you can find the receipts for the, the Bush family and their organization all over the Clintons. Right. And, and the policies that were being put forth in the Clinton administration were really just furthering what they had already accomplished the previous 12 years with Bush and Reagan. So it's, it's really all still the same big incestuous family. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's total pro wrestling as, as oh, we yeah. know at that, at that level, because you go, Oh, George H.W. Bush in 92 is running for re-election against this up young upstart Bill Clinton, who is the governor of Arkansas. Boy, heads, Bush wins, tails, uh, Clinton wins. But either way, the enterprise wins because who was running the cocaine in for the enterprise in the mean Arkansas? Bill Clinton was. That's how that's the reason why they knew he could be trusted to become the president. So when it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, it's an election between two guys that are buddies, they're, they're you know, like the CEO, George H.W. Bush versus his, uh, I don't know, head of marketing or CFO or whatever. So, you know, head of so marketing would probably be a good description for it. Yeah, he's head of, he's head of product Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for in the 80s. He's Bill in charge of product. distribution. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, in, in te t testing it out. Yeah. In your educated opinion, because this is, this is something that I've thought about for a long, long time, and I've never been able to come up with a satis satisfactory answer myself. In your professional opinion, what information do you think it was that Danny got his hands on that ended up costing him his life? The connections to Israel. No, I, I guess that would do it. Yeah. I think that, I think that when you, it's one thing when your own government has created backdoors into banking software or uh, trial software that allows you access to information that you wouldn't think that they would normally have. It's quite another thing when a foreign country does that basically through the United States. And I think that the, um, I think especially back then, so we're talking about the early nineties and we're talking about a, a process that had ha been happening throughout the eighties back then. Israel was not on the radar as being as involved in uh, in world affairs as, as they're known to be now. I mean, I think now you look back on it and, and, and a lot of people go, sure, I know about USS Liberty and I know about 9-11 and their involvement in it. And we have questions about all kinds of things surrounding them. But back then, I don't think that was really known. And I think it would pay, it, it would be of high importance for them to keep that under wraps as much as they could um, you're going, you know, that the spy agencies are going to be spying and you know, that the white house is going to be dirty and, and, and you, you sh should assume that I think, but, but this variable where it's another country that's doing it. And by the way, the white house is totally neutered to do anything against it because it's been overtaken by Israel and they don't want to talk about that. Like, and they don't want to acknowledge that. So part of this is like, if they find out that the Israelis are really behind this, then the question is going to be, well, what else are they behind? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if, if then were they, you know, w where does this end? Because um, at that point, I think it was a real, it was still a well-kept secret that how, how infiltrated uh, our government was by, by Israel. And now I think it's known. I mean, it's still not great, of course, but, but it's known. I think it's, I mean, you can't, <laughs> you can't look at Chuck Schumer and not know that Israel has control over our politicians. The, the only question is to, to how many and to what extent. So, but back then, um, now to be fair, just the, the Bush administration, the Bush group that was running those, those ops, 
they didn't really you didn't really need to do a half a dozen things to get yourself killed with them i mean he was doing plenty to to get to, i mean to get himself killed they've killed people for less than that than that so it's not exactly like they had to have the best reason in the world but my my assumption and and i guess it, again it's like it's it's an educated guess but 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 once you start to tie foreign nations into this network and 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 he probably made that connection my guess is that he probably was like this is bigger than just the white house this is bigger than the 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 reagan administration this is this is international this right. involves it's global kinds of, boy when you get into that level of comprehension you know the light bulb goes off i think i think for some people when the light bulb goes off it goes off a little too late and i think michael hastings and danny castellero the light bulb went off five minutes too late like oh no well michael hastings definitely what have i done here because yeah. because if you because danny was danny was telling people uh, you know, I need to wrap this thing up because it's starting to get kind of weird, it's starting to get kind of scary. He was starting to get into a place where he was unable to have conversations with his family and friends that were nearby. You know, he was taking them out and like, hey, let's have this conversation out in the woods and not, not you know, in my, not next to, you know, wherever, you know, in a place where they can, they can be listening to us, you know, it, when you start acting like that and then, and same thing with Michael Hastings, he started making, you know, I need to go off the radar he started to write about Stanley McChrystal. He's starting to write about Petraeus. He's starting to write about what a disaster the the wars are in the Middle East. And and then something clicked for him, same as as with Castellero, which is, oh, I need to get out of here immediately. And by that, at that point, when you have that realization, in some cases, you know, depending on the information that you've got, it might be too late. I mean, and in both cases, these guys were murdered course i mean michael hastings was murdered we go through the vault seven uh, uh cia classified secrets that were stolen and released and in that vault seven drop there's technology that that can control remotely control cars and and right. drive them automatically so we know that the technology exists i've been i can't even tell you how many times i've driven down san vicente boulevard in los angeles i know where he died you can't I mean, going 115 miles an hour is, it's, it's just does not comprehend. It's like, you would never, ever do that. Even if someone was chasing you, you'd never do it. So, you know, we get, we get, we have questions about that. We have questions about Danny. Danny is a guy who is af afraid of blood, would never do this, kills himself right before a big story, packs himself. And I mean, come on. And, and so you get a lot of these over, you know, a lot of these these characteristics that that seem to follow the Bushes, the Clintons, and whatever is a uh, dirty coroners that come out and say, "I don't know what to tell you. He must have slipped while he was shooting himself because he shot himself twice in the back of the head, and we're going right. to rule it a suicide." So preposterous and cartoonish that you get the feeling that. For the average person that's not paying attention, they hear suicide and that's the end of it. For anybody with a functioning brain that knows that this isn't suicide, you get a secondary message, which is, yeah, he shot himself in the back of the head twice with a gun and it was ruled a suicide. We need you to know that. We need you right. to see that. We need you to understand that if you decide to go out there and do the same things as this person, You'll wind up dead and everyone and we'll make it look like a suicide too. And for those that, that know that you didn't kill, kill yourself, well, then it'll be part of the ritual for them to have to sit and watch it as everybody else is forced to believe an absurdity that's easily provable. And yet you're still dead and that's just the way it is. So it's a very chilling it's a very chilling effect on people to 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 not just kill them and not just tarnish their reputation by making it look like they killed themselves when in fact they didn't 
but to also make it so sloppy mm. as if to kind of show the people we won't even bother to make it look like a A plus job. You're not even worth it. We'll bring in the JV team to do it. It's not going to be, it's not going to be the scene out of uh, Michael Collins that movie. Did you see that movie yeah. where the two guys show up at the door, zap the guy, inject him in between his toes, put his socks back on, put his shoes back on, put him in his bed, do all that. Stuff. We're not even going to bother to send our A team to go get you. We're going to send the C minus team. Right. And we're going to spend about like- ten grand to solve this problem. Or if you really piss us off, we'll give you the David Carradine where we put you in a rubber bondage suit and hang you in the closet. So there's that too. Wow. So, all right. You published uh, Octopus back in 2017. Is that right? All right. Correct. Uh, Because I I literally started reading it. I'll be completely honest with you. I started reading it about a week ago. Because I was like, all right, I'm just going to knock this out really quick before I talk to Charlie so I can get all my questions answered. And I didn't realize at the time that it was like 500 pages, right? I know. So I'm about 40% of the way through in the last week. That's a great start. It makes it, it feels a little easier to read because the quotes that are in there kind of break it up and it gives you a good, you know, you get, you get through some of these quotes and, and. Well, and you're the halfway quotes, through a page, you know. And, yeah, and the quotes also help illustrate the the narration that you're providing yeah. throughout the course of the book. So it it really is like laying down the pieces of the puzzle for people as you're going through telling the story. So when you were doing the research for this book, uh, how long? Did it take you to gather all of this information together and then put it into a form where you thought it was going to be digestible for the reader? Yeah, that was the, um, the research side of things took 18 months. The writing, I was writing while researching on some of it. A lot of it, was I just compiled notes um and a lot of it i compiled quotes and then i would take it i'd take a quote and then i'd figure out where it was going to go you know there's a couple that you'd come across and you'd just be like this is an all-star quote this is one that like when somebody reads it they they'll have to reread it again they'll they'll think that i was making it up you know you know we every now and then you get a you get a gem right like you get um everybody accusing David Rockefeller and the Rockefeller family of being new world order people and globalists and wanting a one world government, you know, in part because that's what they want and that's what they say they want. So you get this, you know, but, but everyone is always denying it. Oh, you're, you've taken me out of context or that that's not true. Well, and not then you everybody. Get to David, Cause you, you also get, have the quote in there from George Bush who had the aside to whichever reporter it was. I can't remember her name at the moment, but he was like, if the people knew what we were doing, they would chase us down the street and lynch us. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then you get a, a moment of clarity that that was one of them for sure. Where you hear that and you go, did he just say that? Why is that not the lead story on every news broadcast? Right. The, Um, And then you get the David Rockefellers where he writes this big meandering diatribe about my family has been accused of being internationalists and and that we are plotting and that we are uh, trying to form through our various partnerships a world government and that we intend on doing this world government, blah, 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 blah. And he goes on and on and on and on. And he then ends it by saying, now, if these are the charges leveled against me, then I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. And you go, was he drunk? Was he caught on a hot mic somewhere? Like what is it? And you go, no, no, no. That's page 405 from his own autobiography. These people will tell you what they're thinking and what they're doing. If you just let them, they're so arrogant and narcissistic that from time to time, they forget that they're committing crimes and they they should be quiet about this stuff. And so every now and then you get the David Rockefeller quote where he just straight out confesses to it in print in his own autobiography. It's tough. I mean, it's one thing that, yeah, I mean, the only person I think I, I think I've added that the only person I know who's ever been misquoted in their autobiography was Charles Barkley. Uh, and, and there was no indication that 
David Rockefeller ever claimed to be misquoted in his own autobiography. So he said it, he wrote, he said it and wrote it and it's in the book. And so it's in his book and now it's in my book. So some of this stuff you, you kind of like, I was compiling over time, you know, I was like, Oh, I need this. I need that. And it's, but then other, you know, when it came down to the actual writing of it, the writing, the writing process was, was sort of a double-edged sword. At first I was writing and writing and writing in total secrecy because I wasn't sure if I was going to finish it. You know how that is. It's like, you say, you tell everybody, Hey, I'm writing a book. And then your friends are like, Hey man, how's that book coming? You're like, well, I never finished it. You know? So I didn't want to say anything just because I wasn't really sure how it was going to go. And about halfway through the secrecy remained, but the reasoning changed and it got to a point where I knew I was going to finish it. And I knew I was onto something, but then it became like, I don't want to tell anyone I'm writing this because I don't want anybody to stop me. You know, I don't want someone to say, not, not like in a Danny Castellero sort of way, because nobody right. knew who I was, but, but in a, in a more practical way, like your wife telling you like, who, who are you selling this book to? Nobody knows who you are in, in that world. Uh, um, Right, you know, more like, of a crabs you, in the you, bucket type type of way that that probably sure. everyone listening right now is familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how that is. You know, sometimes, sometimes it, sometimes. So it wasn't it wasn't like I I was writing it in secrecy because they were coming to get me or anything like that. It was more like I didn't want someone, I didn't want someone to come up with a very reasonable and very practical, uh, expert. You know. I can't, you know, I reason for me to not write the book. Like you need to be doing something else or this is not a good use of your time. So, but then once it came out, then again, I kind of felt a little bit like I've said a ton. I'm not hiding behind. I didn't leave anything out. I didn't, I didn't go like, oh, let's not talk about them or let's not talk about this person. No, I put everybody in there. Like nobody was off limits. If you were out there advocating for a world government or central banking or wanting to enslave humanity or wanting some country to fight another country and what you're, it was going in there. I wasn't going to pull any punches on that, but, but the, the process, the writing process and everything that was, um, it was it from the time I started to the time it was out was probably about all in a little over two years. Wow. And, uh, and, and, and then after I started, after I put that out and started promoting it, I wound up on Berwick's program, the Anarchist, and we started talking and we started, and he asked if I would, was interested in writing a book with him. And so I started on that. And while I was writing that book, I, I basically finished what I was contributing. I mean, I, I basically finished the bulk of it and i was waiting on jeff to get me his stuff and because i was driving on this project for the most part i'm just sort of laying it out and I, I had an idea but i needed jeff's stuff and um but it wasn't coming because jeff was taking his own sweet time you know and he had a, a million other things going on so before the second book came out i started working on the third book too so so in in that particular case it gets a bit murky as to how long I was working on one and how long I was working on the other, but gotcha. with the octopus, because that was the first one and I wasn't overlapping with anything else. It was like a two year process. And, and, and I'll tell you what, I'm part of me not telling anybody about writing the book worked in my favor, because if I had told somebody, if I told somebody who had written a book before, they would have sat me down and calmly explained to me why I'm insane for writing a book and how much time and effort and work and everything that goes into it. I would have never done it. It wasn't until I got done. I looked back and went, God, what was I thinking? That is a painful process. That is a lot of work. But I will say this. It put me on. Um, it made it 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 made me Writing the octopus book made me better at podcasting because I the, can see that. The, the process of writing is, is you're just over this information all the time. You write it, you write a paragraph about it, and then you change eh, I don't like this. I want to change it up a little bit. But you're you're around names, dates, events, 
sequences of events and it gets in your head. And so now when I hear, um, when I hear Whitney Webb getting interviewed and she's rattling off names and numbers and people are like, how do you do that? Well, first she's super smart. Let's, let's start there. But second, I know how she does it. She writes. And when you write this information over and over and change it and this and that, those, whether you want them to or not, they get stuck in your head, the names and the dates and this and that. And it's uh, the best tool that you could ever have for, for retention and comprehension is to physically write everything. So um, if nothing else, the books put made me a better podcaster because I can now remember things off the top of my head, not because I'm like going through a bunch of notes or have a photographic memory or anything like that. I just have been around it a lot right. over and over and over again. And that that's helpful. That also helps for like connecting the dots. You know, when David Icke writes a book like Dot Connector, you know, the more dots you ha you know of, the more dots you can recall at like a split second moment's notice, the better chance you're going to have to see who who fits in in that you know in, in that little puzzle. And so I, I highly recommend people uh, to to write as much as they can, however they can, whether they publish it or not. Maybe, but but the the act of actually writing it. Does something. I, yeah. does something to your brain. I would agree. And I think that's actually fantastic advice, especially for people who are coming at these subjects brand new, because it can be very overwhelming when you start uncovering, uh, you know, uh, just stacks and stacks of information. And you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this. I mean, that's a perfect opportunity for each individual to sit down and be like, all right, let me start putting stuff in an order that makes sense. Because over the process of doing that, you're going to make new synaptic connections in your brain. And that's what actually allows the information to stick over time. I would imagine that there are facts and details that you can recall literally at a second's notice that just absolutely like floors the other people around you. And they're like, how did you do that? Oh, yeah. Like knowing that Henry Kissinger wrote a National Security Council Memorandum 200 on November 8th, 1974. I should have. There's no reason why I should know that I was two years old. But I know that because when you read the memo, you have to read it four times because you go, I can't believe I'm actually reading this. What is the scenario here? I'm trying to think, OK, what was going on? Who was in the White House? Who was doing what? All right, we've got in there and what was this you know and so part of a lot, a lot of this is dates and i and i you know i'm not some guy who like was a history major or anything like that god that'd be the worst thing in the world i feel i i actually tell people i feel like uh i i went through school like like most of us did and i learned history and then i went out into the real world and i had to unlearn everything that i thought I knew and then relearn a new version of history. So I guess if you're looking to pass the test, you have to regurgitate the answer that the teacher wants. But just understand that when you get done with your scholastic uh, history programs, you are going to have to forget all of that stuff because so much of it is just a prime example of history being written by the victors and and agendas being involved. And now, especially if you go back and look at at edu the education system created by the Rockefellers and Carnegie's uh, tinkered with further by Bill Gates. Then you mm -hmm. look at the university system, you go, Ooh, like all that information feels poison to me. You know, like I, like it, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't trust it. If, um, if your life depended on it, that you're going to, that, that all that information is, is true. So if you're interested, if you're somebody that likes puzzles and I think you have to be kind of a, you know, one of, one of those types of people that that gets on a gets on a uh a, a topic and 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 doesn't want to get off until they figured it out then boy the the conspiracy research mm. field is never ending i mean there's so much there's so much to to learn and so much to understand and these characters that you have been hearing of all your life, you know, and, and you thought you knew who they were. I remember, remember George H.W. Bush was known as the wimp. 
Right. And he would say, I don't, I don't like broccoli and I don't have to eat my broccoli. And they'd say, Oh, George W. Bush is the wimp. And I didn't know any differently. And I thought maybe, maybe he's just like a, you know, and I didn't like broccoli either. So maybe I was like, well, I can understand. I can certainly understand that. And, and, and then you go back through history and you go, maybe one of the most dangerous presidents of our, in the history of, of our country and he's and, and he was known as the wimp. Oh, yeah. I bet he loved that. I bet he secretly loved that. He's the type of guy that would love for you to think one thing about him and then in actuality, you know, not an you know, oh, this is a, a non-poisonous snake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not acting like the poisonous snakes. Right. You know, that's because he doesn't want you to see the rattle. That's because he doesn't want you to see the fangs. That's because it's not to his advantage. He wants you to think that he's he's scared of broccoli. Oh, but you know what I mean? So so I, I looking back on the, on all these characters that that the media created for us, boy, man, it's it it Oliver North stood up there, put his hand up, and had his uniform on. He was going to protect the Constitution. Or anything. Oliver Storm, Storm, uh, Oliver, sorry, Oliver all right, North. We'll, we'll get that Oliver in post. Storm, Storm, uh, Oliver North and his um, group of hired killers were some of the most dangerous people around in the 80s and 90s. So like everything that we were taught was like complete it just if not completely upside down, just so perverted that that um you basically just need to dump it all and start from the beginning. Maybe you recognize the names, but you have to have you have to form new associations with how those names connect to one another because what we were told and how we were told like you know, who the bad guys are and who the good guys are. All that stuff is just nonsense. Well, even even the whole good guys versus bad guys dialectic, right? Like there, it, for my money, there aren't, as, as far as like the international power structure goes, there are no good guys. It's just all bad guys looking out for their own interest. So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right as far as that is concerned. Having to relearn everything that you thought you already knew once you start, you know, pulling at that at that string that's frayed a little bit on the tapestry, and oh, oh, a little bit more came off. What's this? What have I got here? And I've and I've had I've had instances where I've been head faked twice. Prime example: Mikhail Gorbachev as one of them. Right, Mikhail Gorbachev. When I was a kid, he was the president of the Soviet Union. He was the head of Russia and, and everyone. He always seemed fairly reasonable to me. He, was, he didn't, you know, he didn't do the Nikita Khrushchev and, you know, we will bury you sort of theatrics or anything like that. He always seemed very reasonable and calm, but he was the Russians and the Russians were the bad guy. And I know that because I saw Rocky IV. And, and so you go through the 80s and Mikhail Gorbachev's the bad guy, right? And then... I watched the untold history of the United States by Oliver Stone, his 10 part series. Right. And you go through that and you watch that and you go, wait, Mikhail Gorbachev is a good guy. And then you go, Oh my God, like he was a good guy all along. And then you find out that in actuality, he was a bad guy all along. He was secretly a globalist guy. That's why he would turn up at the world economic forum and United nations things. And then you go, so he was a bad guy, but he wasn't, bad for the reasons I thought he was bad in the eighties. Then he becomes a good guy for me in about 2012 or so. And he's a good guy for me for about six years. And then I find out in actuality, he's a bad guy because he's a globalist uh, who wants a new world order and a one world government. But, and he's doing Louis Vuitton ads and, but so he's a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy for the original reasons I had. He's a bad guy for something totally different. So I've had to, I've had to keep my head on a swivel. You know what I mean? And I, and I've had to try to be as humble about this information as possible because, you know, this is what I believe given the information that I currently have. But I, I, fully understand that sometimes new information is brought to light things that you thought you knew turn out to not necessarily be true so i always want to give myself that the flexibility i guess to to 
to change my mind on things if new and better information is presented. Like the last thing I want to do is be so, you know, tied to a particular narrative because that that's what I always believe to be true, or that's what I believe to be true. Even though new information has come up and has said, well, actually this is, some of this is, isn't exactly as you, as you believed it to be. I want to know the truth. Even if it means that I was wrong about some stuff, I can live with that. Fine with that. Actually, frankly, it means that you're kind of, you're still looking, <laughs> which I think is a good sign, right? Mm -hmm. If you're still, the, what you don't want to do is you don't want to get to a place where you're like, oh, I'm done knowing the truth. I'm good. I put it in my books. I put it in my podcasts. I don't need anything to interfere with it. Listen, if something comes up and I'm wrong about something, then let's talk about it. You know, I'm, then I'm wrong about it. And that's okay. I can, hell, I've been wrong about plenty of things and will continue to be wrong. But what I don't want to do is be wrong and then like double down digging. on it yeah that yeah. seems like that seems like the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here we're trying to figure out how it all fits right right and i don't have all the pieces and 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 i welcome people that do have all the pieces and if i've got two pieces that i've got fit to get you know how you figure in a jigsaw puzzle and you go oh they pretty much fit like they kind of fit they look like they should fit and then you go eh, they really don't though so sometimes you have to just be okay with that. That's tough. That's tough to do, but oh, you've yeah. got to. Absolutely. Well, especially if you it's be an in intellectually honest about it, you have to be. Yeah. Especially once you get into a situation where it is something that you have known for a long, long time and you've gotten comfortable with that knowledge. And then somebody wants to come along and knock you off of that plateau, right? With, with what appears to be better information, but you know, because you're in that space of comfort, you're just not willing to hear it. Yeah. And I mean, you, you talk about this in the, in the beginning of octopus as well, you know, preparing to make that, that journey alone to find out the truth about the realm that we inhabit, which is in my estimation, one of the most difficult things that a, an individual can undertake in this day and age. So, Looking back on starting the journey for yourself, what do you wish you had prepared yourself for ahead of time? Well, wow, that's a hell of a question because the short answer is I'd still do it all again. I enjoy this information. The reason why I wrote the first book was, was so simple. It was a conversation I had with my mom and and I and I was explaining some new conspiracy to her and I just given her all this information. She was listening to it. She's always very open-minded to this. I think she knew kind of there's a problem with the world. And I would and I laid this whole thing out and she said, This is amazing. This is really fascinating. This is interesting topics. You've got all this information. What are you gonna do with it? Like, what's the plan? And I was like, what? I don't, I, I don't have a plan. There's no plan. I, I, I just like it. I'm just interested in it. I just find it interesting. She's like, oh, okay. She's like, I just wondered if you had, if you were going to like ever do something with it, or was this just as far as it goes for you? And I was like, oh, you know, like it had never even occurred to me that I had a role with this or, or in any way, you know, and then I was thinking, well, who am I, you know, to get involved and do this? You know, I'm no John Perkins. I'm no David Icke as I'm, you know, I'm reading their books and everything. Little did I know that I'd wind up interviewing them years later and starting to be, become like friendly with them. Um, but at the time I was just some guy that liked the information. And, and it wasn't until that conversation that I, that I decided that, well, if, okay, if I'm going to have a role in this, then I need to make sure that I'm not just some jackass who half ass it. So I guess, you know, if I had to go back and do, you know, if, go back and sort of do, do it again in, in one regard, I would be, I'd probably be a little bit more prepared that like, there's no off ramp for this. Like you don't just go back to 
throwing your hands up and going, ah, oh, well, you know, whatever. I guess it doesn't matter. Nobody, you, you just, you, you just, you, once you see the magician's trick, you can always see the magician's trick. You can never sit in an audience and watch that magician do that and think anything other than it's in his left hand. He's got the dove in his left hand and it's in his back pocket or whatever. You know what I mean? You're, you're always working it out. You can see it. And so I, 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 I'm glad that I did it. It is a very, there's no money in it. That's the the thing. It'd be way better if there was money in it. Wait, wait, wait. wait. You mean you're not having anything, thousands just... of dollars thrown at you by the wellness company every month? <laughs> so, no, I haven't had. Um, you know, I'm a little offended. I haven't been bought, try, offered to be bought I, off. Yet. You know I'm what? Little, if I was in your too... position, I would be offended as well. I'm a little offended. I haven't been uh, asked to join a white supremacist organization because I've got the whiteness and the baldness down. I already am. I'm like halfway there and like physically physical appearance. Haven't been in, uh, asked to join that. And nobody's tried to buy me off. But yeah, there's no there's no real money in the book writing unless you get extremely lucky and you write like. You're Daniel Estelin, you write a book called Bilderberg, you translate it into Spanish and you sell 7 million copies. Right. Like, re, re, and I talked to, uh, uh, you know, I talked to to the publisher of, 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 of his book and I said, how, like how, please tell me how you sell 7 million copies. He goes, he did it, he wrote it in Spanish, promoted it in Spanish. I go, that's the secret? Like I get... Yo comprendo un poquito espanol. We can work something out. He's like, well, you know, I mean, you got to know, you got to be able to promote it in Spanish too. All right. Well, whatever. I don't know that that's necessarily the, 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 the thing that did it for him. But you put a book out there, and it's a very, um, it's a very strange feeling because you can't really control the response to it. You know, you're lucky if you get a response. Frankly. You know, if anyone even recognizes that it's out there, there's so many books that get produced each year. And and I think the curve is like, you know, it's definitely a downward trend uh, in terms of Americans reading. And that's not great. I could, um, you know, and so so if you're able to even write a book, that's an accomplishment. If you're able to get it out to the general public and have people read it, that's an accomplishment. And if you do too good of a job with it, then you wind up like Danny Castellaro. So like there, you, you're, you're always trying to search for like, where, the, I don't know, where's a good place to be in this whole thing. It's like, well, free enough to write your books and, and not have them uh, edited or confiscated or whatever. And, 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 and popular enough so that enough people read it but not so popular that that it gets everybody killed. knows where to get you. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I've watched David Icke now get banned from like an entire continent, basically an entire con two continents, two continents. He, continents. Cause okay. Australia as well too. Yeah. And I, I mentioned that I mentioned him that to him at an Arcapulco and, and his, his response to me was 38 countries that I'm aware of. And I was like, yeah, I guess. Yeah, he says, there's a bunch I haven't even tried to get into that probably won't let me in. So, you know what I mean? Like, that's extremely inconvenient. So you could be the David Ikes, of course. You could be the Danny Castelleros. You don't want to be that. You could be some author who writes a book and sells eight copies of it. That sucks as well. So where do you want to be in this whole mix? I enjoy writing. I just want to keep writing. And and I've really found that as somebody that's not musical or or artistic in that regard. And I never felt like all these people say, I'm an artist. And I'd be like, God, I am not, you know, I am really, if by these definitions, I am not. But when it comes to writing, I really enjoy it. It's been, it's been one of the, it's been the best thing I've ever done. And, and, and of course, no formal training, not part of my vision board, not on my five-year plan. None of this stuff was planned. So, so if you're out there and you're and you're thinking I should write a book, but I don't know how to do any of these things. Neither did I. It's fine. It's not required. What is required is is dedication because it'll take a long, long time, 
and get your facts straight and then promote it like crazy. Get out there and talk to the world because if you're sitting around waiting for Amazon to sell your books for you, you'll be waiting forever. Oh yeah, it's not going to happen. But again, that just proves to everyone listening that if you want to accomplish something, it is never too late to start. Take, for example, Vlad the Impaler, who didn't even start putting people on pikes until he was well into his 30s. You know, before that, he probably didn't even know it was possible. And, and now he's basically a household name. Somebody said, and he probably didn't tell anyone that he wanted to put them on pikes early on because he thought people would think, this is a crazy idea. You'll never Probably. do that. <laughs> I can so just imagine quiet. tinkering around in the dungeon. What is going to be the best way to do this? <laughs> well, you touched on it a little bit earlier, and believe it or not, we're already 50 minutes uh, into this interview. Uh, time has wow. just been flying by. I want to make sure that we respect your time because I know you've got a lot going on. Okay. But you touched on it earlier, the third book, uh, that you have now produced, and I'm probably going to butcher the name, but when I read it, it looks like hypo crazy to me. Yep. Am I pronouncing it wrong? Hypoc crazy. Hypoc crazy. Okay. Yeah. That it was the it it came out of that was the one I started working on while I was writing Controlled Demolition as well. This this was more of like a social uh, commentary. The, the the sub headline or the subtitle is uh, hypocrisy surviving in a world of cultural double standards. And I think that that's one of those things that people go out and they see in life. They see these double standards. They're just so blatant and right in their face that it is incredibly frustrating. You start. So I wanted to do a real good deep dive on, on hypocrites uh, and in order to do that, you've got to get into some of the major hypocrites, which you, you absolutely positively have to cover religion. Oh, yeah. World class leaders in hypocrisy. Oh. Right. <laughs> you know, so you get into all of all of the social stuff, the politics. To, um, I went on Mel Kay's show and, and when that book came out and she's got kind of a heavily like right leaning audience. And, and in that book, there's a, there's a chapter where I just take the, I just take the Biden administration out back and just, just kick the shit out of them in this, in, you know, just example after I mean, example, after it's example. kind of low hanging fruit when you, when it you is, really think about it. It's very easy to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and went through this whole thing. And then the next chapter is Trump and, and I can I can tell when her audience got to the Trump part because then the emails change. You motherfucker! You think you know you th you oh you you think you like Biden? You like Biden better? It's like, did you read the chapter right <laughs> before it where I said all? I mean, it's so it's it's interesting that you what you find is that half the people half the people out there they'll agree with you. You know, and I wrote that back. Half the people were a hundred percent on board with half of the book. <laughs> the other half of the people were most definitely not on board with it. But that was the thing is I'm not going to pander to anybody. I'm not going to say like, let's make fun of the Democrats because they're crazy lunatics, which of course they are and leave the Republicans out. Are you kidding me? And miss out on all the fun. Why would I do that? So I took I took equal shots at both political parties, at all the religions, which didn't make me many fans, um, but it had to be done. And uh, races, racial stuff too, making fun of white people, making fun of black people, you know, all the, all the hypocritical components where you see it and laid it out with 400 footnotes to back it up. And, and, and part of that was like, kind of came out of the the conversation I had with Berwick when we were writing Controlled Demolition. I said to him, like, okay, I'm coming off of a crazy book. And you, Jeff Berwick, are a polarizing figure. You've got a massive audience, and there's a lot of people that want to tell you that you're, that you're wrong or you're stupid or that you're lying or whatever. So it was like, we need to make sure this book is buttoned up. Like, we can't, if we're, if we're speculating, we need to say we're speculating. If it's facts, we've got to have footnotes. We've got to have, and it can't just be like 
Bob down at the barbershop said. It's got to, I got to, we got to give them something that they can really take to the bank. And the same was, same thinking for hypocrisy, but it was a little different. The reasoning that I had for hypocrisy was I better put the footnotes in here, not because people are worried about Jeff Berwick and wanting to make him look stupid or try and find some sort of flaw in his thinking or, you know, because they just have a problem with him. Instead, it was, I need to put all these footnotes in because when I write a, a paragraph that's talking about how it is illegal for you to collect your own rainwater from your own property mm -hmm. in, in Oregon and that it is punishable by jail time, I need to make sure that that footnote is there because if I don't put it in there, you'll think I'm making it up because it's so preposterous that, of course, it can't be real. And so it it it, it was a little a little bit like as I'm writing this book, I'm going, don't yell at me. Here's the news story. It's it's tied to. I'm not the one saying this or making this up. This is if you got a problem with it, then take it up with take it up with the universe, right? <laughs> because it's a true story. And here's well, where take it's it up true. with the state of Oregon. Because they're the take one that, the state that of Oregon, wrote the sure. statute. Yeah. Yeah. So so that was kind of uh, the the third book was more of like a social commentary. It's a lot more fun. It's a lot. The, the, the cover is, is cartoonish. It's got Uncle Sam in a padded cell in a straight jacket with like Thorazine eyes. And he's got his red, white and blue hat on. He's missing a shoe. And, you know, he, he's been institutionalized. And I thought, you know, like America has been, you know what I mean? Just 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 put put just put the whole country in a padded cell on a 72 hour hold, let everybody calm down, call it, call your mom to come pick, you know, your government's down here acting crazy again. We're going to need you to come pick it up. It, it, so I, I thought about that as like a, as a concept that like, it's one thing to just be a liar, but it's another thing to be a hypocrite too. It's so frustrating to deal with those people. It's one thing if it's like, like I had a buddy who was Friday night. It, we all lived in Vegas. Friday night was like, we're going out to a club, bottle service, chicks, all that stuff. Right now I'm married at the time, so I'm not doing any of this stuff. With him. But, but he would, he, that was Friday night. Saturday would be recovery day. Sunday would be church day. And in Monday, I'd get the text from him, sort of like a kind of like a lecture, like, bro, when are you going to make it out to church with me? I'm like, I, I'm not ever going to church with you. Just so you know, he'd be like, you know, we just need, and then there'd be like a conversation some other time. He'd just be like, man, you just need to let, you know, Jesus into your heart. I was like, Here's my problem. Fine. Jesus in my heart. Great. Coke and hookers. Fine too. But, but my problem is you cannot be Coke and hooker guy on Friday and Jesus guy on Sunday and expect me to take you seriously. It's the, the hypocrisy is staggering, right? You could be either one of them and, I, and that's fine. But when you try to be both and it's obvious that you're neither, you just look like a clown. Right. And that was kind of how I, I came at the hypocrisy stuff. It's like be Donald Rumsfeld if you if you want, if that's who you are and you're just a total or 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 I should say be Dick Cheney. Dick, there's nothing charming about Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney was what he was, right? He was just like a, a horrible, terrible guy. And then you've got these other guys that that try try to get you to think that they're the nicest guy in the world. Almost respect Dick Cheney more for just never pretending to be anything other than a soulless serial killer, which is what he is. You know, somebody that wants to destroy the world and bomb uh, countries into submission. Yeah, yeah. The we'll shoot somebody straight Rumsfeld. in the face with a shotgun and then blame the person that he just shot for getting shot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So everybody knew that Dick Cheney was an awful guy. But the guy that infuriated everybody the most was Rumsfeld because he was every bit Dick Cheney, 
Dick Cheney wishes he was as evil and diabolical as Donald Rumsfeld. I but Donald Rumsfeld came out and we'd be like, hey, how's it going? And I'm Do- Don Rumsfeld. Nice to meet you. Hey, I've got some brand new carpet over here. I'd let, are you are you in the market for some carpet? You know, you just look at this guy and you just go, I wouldn't trust that guy at all. Yeah. The, and, the epitome and, of the sleazy used car salesman. No doubt. It, with the pick in and, and then you and then you look into his political history and it's and it's just like that too. It's the picture of him shaking hands with Saddam Hussein. Yep. And you go, How did that happen? How is that picture happening? Aren't you the guy that's saying we need to go in and get Saddam Hussein and kill him? Or, why oh well, well you that's know, how that's they me. know that they had the WMDs, right? Because because Rumsfeld was instrumental in selling the components to him. So right. Yeah. Well, ha- Saddam Hussein has chemical weapons, uh, D- Donald Rumsfeld would say. And, and the, the question would be, how do you know he has chemical weapons? And, he, and the answer should have been because I sold them to him in the 80s. But he couldn't really say that. So instead it was like, well, we found aluminum tubes. You're like, and? <laughs> From the Chappelle show? Yeah. Aluminum tubes, you know? <laughs> Do you know what they can do with aluminum? They throws the table over. That's that's my frustration. Is is the is the is the Rumsfelds the hypocrites? You know, I mean, like Dick Cheney can't help it. He's a soulless psychopath. He's got no charisma at all. But guys like Don Rumsfeld, oh, the worst, the worst of the worst. You know, and so I I thought it would be fun to. Uh, to do, you know, to have, you know, to point these guys out um, uh, in a variety of, of, of ways and, and and do that. So that was book number three. It was less um, intense, less like super scary and more like get a load of these dipshits, you know, and here are all the footnotes for it too. Nice. Well, I'm definitely going to have to get around to reading that one. Uh, as well, because that that sounds like a lot more my speed, uh, just teeing off on these psychopaths and uh, backing it up with evidence. Yeah, imagine yeah, that. It's, evidence, it's fun. It's almost helps. a spectator sport. Yeah, and and it's um, and I think that the more that I think recently now, after going through what we went through with the 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 virus situation in 2020 you get a lot of people that are now newly aware that something's going on and they're in some form of waking up to it and, uh, and they're open. They're open to things not being um, exactly as they appear to be, or, or as we were told that they were. And it, they, they recognize there's a problem. They've come to the first major problem that they've seen. They said, this whole COVID stuff, there's nothing to it. I mean, this is, this is, there's big messaging problems, scientific lot, you know, lies, the media is involved, pharmaceuticals involved. And you go, this just feels like there's, this just feels like a gigantic scam. And you go, yes, now that you're here, man, would you like to see a, a, a vast array of other scams? If, if, if this has got you frustrated, wait till you hear about this. Or if you recognize this character, I think Fauci might be lying. Would you like to know what he was doing in the eighties? Yes, I would. Well, you hear about AIDS, didn't you? Yeah. You know who was in charge of that? Like, no, get out of here. So it's a prime like time for people that are awake from COVID to now start to ask questions. If this was a lie, what else is a lie? And so we're sort of, we almost kind of have a, like a responsibility for those people to kind of let them know, like, don't stop with this one thing. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is just the first massive lie you've come in contact with. There are others. Maybe you need time to process this one and that's fine. Take as much time as you need, but when you're ready and when you want to ask questions and when you think that when you're curious how this all fits together, go grab, Bill Cooper's book, Behold a Pale Horse, and read that. Oof. And then read Fingerprints of the Gods by Graham Hancock. Mm. And then go read The Trigger by David Icke. And then read The Octopus of Global Control by me. Then go read, you know, go 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 read some of the, the more obscure texts out there. Mm-hmm. 
and you go read some Anthony Sutton under blackmail by Whitney Webb. And then you, then you start to go, hang on a second here. I think the, the one, the one thing that Whitney sort of makes crystal clear. And I think everybody can now connect to this if, if, if they choose to. And, And that is, she says, there is no difference between government and organized crime. Government is organized crime. It's just, a different flavor of it. And I think most people now can hear that and go, it is, you're right. She's right. It is a form of organized crime. It's crime. They're all criminals and they are definitely organized. And we think of organized crime as like the mafia and some fat Tony gets whacked in front of, uh, you know, an Italian place in broad daylight or what, you know, or he's coming out at dinner and then you get, she, yeah, yeah, there's that for sure. That's a that's a form of organized crime. That's the way the the movies would have you believe organized crime is. But I I, I would, you know, Ron Paul said I he talked about that there was there were more plottings and ter- there were there were more criminal plottings and conspiracies mm-hmm. happening within a five mile radius of his office in Washington D.C. than in anywhere else in the world. Yeah, and he was right, of course, because that is where a lot of this crime becomes organized. Mm -hmm. And And that's exactly uh, why I call it the district of criminals as, as well as many other people call it that that's, that was not my original. I stole it from somebody else and I'm sure somebody will steal it from me. And it's true though, because in, and if you think about that, I know a lot of people go, Oh, well, but they can't all be bad. Well, you're right. They, they can't, maybe they're not all bad, but the problem is that Washington DC has this reward mechanism that's set up to give you a variety of people, the things that they want. And for some people it's power and that's pretty straightforward. And for other people it's money. And that's obviously pretty straightforward as well. Others, it's a little bit more murky. You know, they want, um, maybe it's sexual. Maybe they're, they're, they've got some addictions that way. Maybe they like kids. You know, there's always that, but whatever it is that gets you going, whatever it is that makes you the apex predator that you envision yourself to be, you've gotten to the top of this hill. If you're, if you're in Congress or something, you're really, you're really one of a group of, you know, 500 or so people that have, have figured out how to navigate up to a position of power at that. And it's not, it's not real power, but it's perceived power, I guess. But, but whatever it is that you want, they've figured it out by the time you get there. And there's more of that where, where it came from. And so they'll get you however they can get you. And if they make a miscalculation, whereas they think that what you probably, they think that what you want is the orgies and you don't, and you're Madison Cawthorn and you start talking about it, how you go to the parties and there's orgies there. They made a miscalculation on him. They thought that yeah. that was going to be the thing that would get him. You know, if it had gotten him, you would have never heard about it. But, but uh, you did hear about it. And then he, where'd he go? Oh, he's gone. He went away pretty pretty yep. quick. He went. They sent him home. Right. Yep. He's he's not he's not there anymore. Yeah. They so uh, they primaried his ass is uh, how I believe they refer to it. Yeah. 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 They prim. Oh, and by the way, you better hope that that your exit from politics is somebody primarying your ass because considering what else they could do to your ass, you're getting off easy. That's true. Charlie, do you have time for one more question? I do. Let's awesome. do it. All sure. right. So we're going to, we're going to completely switch gears from what we've been discussing for the last hour and 10 minutes now. Uh, I promised the audience last week that I would make sure to ask this question because you are not shy about speaking about your experimentation with various substances. Yes. So I am curious to know what your craziest psychedelic experience in your entire life has been. Okay. This is an easy one. For, I mean, easy in the sense that I know which one it is and it's and it's sort of... I can, and, and I'll paint this picture. I go to Anarcapulco in Acapulco, Mexico. The largest anarchist conference in the world happens each year in Acapulco, Mexico. My co-author, Jeff Berwick, founder of the Dollar Vigilante, he's been putting on Anarcapulco 
for the for 10 years this a, a month ago we had the 10th one uh i go to the one in 2019 and one of the nice things about this week long event is that you buy your ticket or you know or or you you know you get your hotel room and you you you've got a schedule for what's going on each day different speakers at different times and you can kind of map it out accordingly at night there's a lot going on there's dinners there's um there's certain a la carte items that you can add to your experience that might be releasing baby sea turtles into the wild at night from the marine nature preserve that's down the street which is a very popular thing to do or maybe you're into uh, playing golf or maybe you're into going to workshops or maybe you're into just doing the VIP dinner where you go have dinner with Ron Paul and all that stuff. And all those things are amazing and fun to do. But one of the a la carte items you can add on is um, ayahuasca, DMT, peyote, and the, the different days, different things. And at least in 2019 and 2020, back when it was at the other f place, you could just sign up in advance and you book your session and they have shaman there. It's really well done. And, the, the, and so I did that in 2019 and I got, I did the ayahuasca the first night, like the, I was a speaker Monday. So I spoke Monday and then I did the ayahuasca Monday night. And then I think DMT was like, Thursday night. So then I had a couple of days and then Thursday night I do do the ceremony. And when, and I went, you know, by myself and there were maybe 30 people in the session and the shaman starts partnering people up, you and you, you and you, and he starts picking people and putting them together. So he says, you and you to me and this other guy, he puts us together and I say, Hey, nice to meet you, man. What do you, you know, what do you, What's your name? He says, my name's Johnny Dollar. And I go, what do you do? And he says, I'm an artist. And I said, what kind of art do you do? And he says, I post pop surrealism. And I go, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> and he goes, I have a, I have a painting of, uh, of Mickey Mouse and he's holding a, a gas canister. And on the side of the gas canister, there's a Bitcoin logo. And over his shoulder is a central bank that's on fire and he's lit it on fire. And I was like, oh my God, man, like we are going to be friends. You're like, I am with you. Okay. Now I know what post-pop surrealism means, you know? So he's my partner for this, right? He goes first and he does his, and I'm supposed to watch him. And then I go second and I do mine. He's supposed to watch me and we get done with that. And how was it? And, you know, and it's like 30 minutes each and it's a good time. And, and so we get done and it's like midnight, right? He's like, he's like, you want to go see this artwork that I'm telling you about? I've got a bunch of, I've got like, these books up in my room. I was like, yeah, let's go up there and smoke a joint, whatever. So we go up to his room and I, he shows me all his art books. And so I stay friends with this guy, Johnny Dollar following year, 2020. Uh, same thing here. Here comes the, the, the DMT ceremony. Let's go do it. Right. So I don't see him for a couple of years. I see him last year, 2023, February. Um, I'm going by Max Egan's bar in Acapulco. I'm walking to it because I don't even know where it is. I just hear this music, dun, 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 like really loud music. So I could tell where it is and I'm walking and walking and walking. Turn around the corner where I expect to see this bar. It's right there. And standing at the beer tub selling beers is Johnny Dollar of all people. I go, what are you doing here? He says, I'm, good to see you, man. What, uh, selling beers. You want a beer? I was like, yeah, but also what are you doing here? He says, I live here now. I'm like in Max's bar. He goes, no, but right above it. And I was like, are you kidding me? So, so we have a good conversation and we, he knows that I've always wanted to smoke DMT. Now, the, the, the two times we did it before, we're now like sort of DMT partners because the universe and a, and a shaman said so, right? But that was 5-MeO DMT, which is like powder and they blow it up your nose. Like the shaman blow, blows it up your nose with this device. It's, it's, it's not the Joe Rogan machine elves conversation. It's, it's not the, this five to seven minute trip. It's a 
30 minute slower. It's not mm. quite ayahuasca, but it's also not quite smokable DMT. It's somewhere in the middle. But I really wanted to try that, like, let's go interdimensional, right? So Johnny says to me, hey, um, I know you've always wanted to smoke DMT. I actually have some. Would you want to do that to, uh, like, would you want to do it? And I said, yes. And he said, how about Friday at sunset? Conference is over. Everything's done. I said, deal. All right. He goes, meet me right back here on Friday at sunset. Now, throughout the rest of the week, I saw him and it wasn't, you know, but we, we kept that date. So, so Friday comes, everything's done with the conference. Sun is set. We meet up, we take some towels down to the beach and he's got a vape pen, which is DMT, which is I'm like, damn, where'd you find that? He says, well, there's a guy that was selling them. So I, so I bought it. I was like, oh man, like you should have bought them all. He goes, I did. <laughs> I was like, see, I, 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 that's why we're friends. Uh, and, and, and so he said, let's, you know, I trust him, you know, and, and I have this relationship with him. So we sit on the beach, we take it very seriously. We get the, everything right. There's nobody around. And, um, and he sort of, since he's done it before, he kind of guides me through this process where he's like, all right, we're going to, you're going to go first and you're going to do two hits and close your eyes, lay back and do all that stuff. So we did that. We did it again. I did it again and again. Now we're going to, for the the final time of the night, this is the fifth session. You can do this relatively with, you know, within, that doesn't take too much time in between, but we've been out there for two hours, you know, talking in between and solving all the world's problems. But this last one, he says, okay, in this last one, I want you to do something different. And he said, I want you to sit up like on your, on your butt and, you know, sort of on your knees. And I want you to just hit this until you can't even think straight and I'll take it out of your hands. You don't have to hand it to just keep going, breathe, breathe, hold it, hold it, but, you know, just keep going. Right. And, and then, but it kicks in in like 15 to 20 seconds. So you don't have too long to really do this. It's going to take over. But he said this time, don't lean back. I want you to keep, I want you to stay seated and I want you to keep your eyes open and I want you to tell me what you see at the end. And I was like, okay. So we do that and I'm sitting and I'm just watching. There's moon is out so I can see the ocean. The ocean's close enough that I can see it. I'm right on the beach, but it's not so close that I'm worried about the water getting me. And I'm watching these waves come in and I'm hitting this thing and hitting it. And, and this last wave, I watch it br come in to break and it just stops and everything just goes, it just like locks everything into position. Nothing moves. And I was like, okay. And almost like it was coming out of the sand all of a sudden, I see this very faint bluish green, almost like laser, kind of like a laser look to it, of a perfect grid. I can see all the way down the beach, everything is gridded out into the ocean, into the water, which is totally stopped. It's not for whatever reason. Waves have stopped crashing for once in, in the Earth's history, in my mind. I look as far back on the horizon as I can see. I can still see this faint green line. And so I just start looking up. And when I look up, I can see every star in the universe. It feels like they move out of the way. But I could still see this grid. And the way to describe it for me is like, computer animation design, right? Like a CAD system where if you're, you're say you're Hollywood and you're making, you know, a golem, right? And it's a CGI effect. It's not a real thing, but they do the first base layer and it's that grid that sort of gives you the framework of, of something black and green. And you can, t that's what it was. It was all just like a, everything went to like a base layer. Like you peeled back a couple layers of reality until you got to oh. this base layer. Now, Johnny didn't tell me anything about it. He just said, keep your eyes open and I want you to tell me what you see when we're done. 
I was like, okay. And at, when I got done with that, I just, I looked over to him. He was sitting next to me, he had this big grin. And I said, oh my God, I saw the grid. And he, and he's smiling. He goes, I know. And I was like, how am I supposed to go back to reality after I've seen this? He said, yeah. he goes, that's why I wanted you to keep your eyes open on this one. I was like, you knew I would see that? He said, yeah, everyone that smokes this stuff sees it. And I was like, okay. So I had to process that for the next year, you know, like really like what did I see? Did I see the framework of the universe? Like, are we in an enclosed system? It felt like it, but you, but you feel a lot of things too, and um, and that to me, I mean, I've done mushrooms where it's like you know everything's a little fuzzy around the you know the sides, or somebody comes up and has a has a strange conversation with you, or some guy feel you know kind of feels like a cartoon those are all interesting and neat and, and cool, like visual tricks. But that was the one that made me think like, Oh no, everything I understand about reality is wrong. And that is a very scary feeling kind of like, I wasn't scared because I was with somebody I trusted and I wasn't worried about anything, but I was like, it opened up a can of worms from, for my brain, you know, like if this is true, if this is a real thing, if I've, if this is a grid, if there's a, if this is, a, if we're in a simulation and you can't ever know that you're in a simulation because that would screw up the simulation. If the people or the, the characters knew that they were in it, they wouldn't, they'd know they were being watched and it wouldn't work. It felt like somebody was like, come here, you want to see something like, peek behind this curtain real fast, take a look at this. And I saw it and I went, uh, my little brain can't process this. Yeah, fully. you basically saw the wizard at his machine, you know, doing his thing is what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and of course, you know, like I'm not religious. So maybe if I were religious, I might've gone to a different place with that. Or, or maybe I would have become non-religious after that or less religious or something. I don't know. But, but in my mind, just, I, mean, I think, I think it's kind of important for the, for the discussion that I, that I mentioned that I'm not religious. So I didn't, I didn't have like a, I saw that God created the universe or whatever. It wasn't right. that for me. It, 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 frankly, it left me with more questions than answers. Really. I was just like, great. Now I have to deal with this. Wonderful. That's what I said to him. Like, how, like how, how am I supposed to go back to paying bills when mm. like I've seen the grid? He's like, exactly right. Like, what difference does anything make? I'm like, ah. Oh. So that was that was. Um, that's a doozy. That yeah, really is. man, that's a doozy for sure. Because I'm all, I, you know. I don't, I don't know what level you need to be at where you can handle something like that. Right. I wasn't, I mean, I handled it as best as I could, but I wasn't like, Oh, this is normal. I was like, right. Damn. This yeah. Is it sounds like you normal. were ill prepared to, to experience that at the time. Yes. But I'm glad he didn't tell me what to look for. I'm I'm glad he knew he knew enough to not say look for this cuz if cuz you know he cuz as like a science as a psychonaut you know you don't want to like pre-program somebody for their trip you right. want them to you want it to be organic to them and authentic and you don't want to say like oh you know make sure you tell me if you see the the grid for the simulation it's like wait, what, what, what am I going to see? And then it kicks in. Then, then of course you're looking for it. So I had no, no preconceived ideas. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't thinking about it. Um, in fact, the, 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 the times before during that session, when I had my eyes closed, I didn't get any of that feeling at all. Hmm. I got, I got a feeling 
one time, uh, one of the first times that night, the feeling was like, you know, those dentist lamps that are like that they pull down and like turn, they can configure it. And then you've got like a bright light shining in your mouth, you know, yeah. from one of these like movable bright lights. I spent one of the, the DMT sessions feeling like there was a bright light on the right side of me. Like somebody had put one of those dentists, you know, like I could feel it. I could feel it, but only on this side. It didn't, it wasn't on the other side. It was just on this side. And I also felt like, um, like a, I've described it as like the mechanical arm that they use to paint cars with, you know, mm. it kind of like zzz, kind of goes around and it sprays all sides of the car. I had a, that's the best description comparison I can make is that it felt like something was scanning me, like hmm. starting with like my, my left foot and going up my left side and all the way around, around my head coming down and like, like doing a quick scan of me. I wasn't scared or I wasn't, uh, I didn't get any messages and have anybody say, oh, you have like left knee cancer or something. I mean, I didn't get any, nothing like that happened, but I got this feeling that something was scanning me. And then I got that bright light right on the, on the one side of my face. And I was just like, like doesn't do any good to turn or look or it's a feeling. It's not actually there. It feels like it's there, but you know, it's not there. And so I had, I had that, that was the the trip up until that point. So I had no reason to think I was going to see anything grid related. And every time before I'd had my eyes closed. And so I was getting bright lights and geometrical patterns, all the, all the things that you normally hear, browns, oranges, uh, dark reds, yellows, colors that are like very earthy colors. Those things were replicating in geometrical shapes. I never got entities. I never got machine elves. I never got hmm. any of that stuff. I was looking, I was looking for it. I mean, I was aware, consciously aware to keep my eyes open or whatever, my third eye open for, for that. And I never saw any of it, maybe because I was looking for it, but the grid stuff blew my mind. So I wasn't looking for it. Didn't think I'd see it. Didn't know what I was going to see really but I certainly wasn't waiting for that. And the funniest part was that the guy I was with knew I would see it. And he was right. And I don't know how he was right, but he was right. Well, because he's seen it himself. That, that would be the obvious answer, I would think. Yeah. So did you try to reproduce the experience this year or did you decide, uh, I've, I've seen it once. That's all I need. Um, well, yes and no. Uh, I, I do like a good, uh, psychedelic experience when I get a chance. And so I did have an opportunity, same thing, Friday night, end of the week on a beach this time, different, this time I was with a shaman. I was with Bearheart, who I'd met the year before. Doesn't look like a shaman when you've first see him he looks like he ought to be playing middle linebacker for the bears you know I mean, he's just a huge dude and i first time i saw him, he had this big gown on this, this big like robe and like pants no shirt and like a big gown and he was walking by in this big beard and i remember thinking i don't know who that guy is but he is definitely important <laughs> like i don't like he certainly looks like he's important right so so this time around it dmt wasn't on the menu but bufo was what's bufo, what's bufo bufo is toad venom oh wow there is a there is a frog that lives in the sonoran desert in northern mexico and and i know this because shaman bearheart explained the whole story to me this toad lives in a hole 10 months out of the year. And all it does is it goes down in this hole and it just meditates and it hibernates in this weird meditation. It doesn't eat, it doesn't drink, it doesn't come out of the hole. Then in the rainy season, it comes out for about two months. It drinks water, it eats, it reproduces, it does all those things. Then it goes back in the hole and it meditates for 10 months. 
And I like, I have no idea how they figured this out, but the secretion from this toad is liquid and you can, without harming the toad, you can like kind of squeeze on it, get this secretion out and then it, and then you let it dry and then you flake it off and smoke it and it's DMT. It's a hundred percent DMT, but it is DMT wrapped in love. <laughs> if you want to put it that way, it's not, it's a very like warm hug while you're going into hyperspace. So maybe, so it had maybe like uh, more like mushrooms as opposed to LSD. If we're trying to make an analogy. Yeah. I always, I always, a. Uh, uh, I always enjoyed mushrooms more than, um, than LSD because it felt a little earthy and I liked, I liked Bufo a lot, a whole lot. It had all of the very positive things of, of DMT, but it was less scary and more like, you're going to be okay. Like you're going to get what you need here. You're going to get some confirmation about, whether you're on the right track or not. And if you get that, you're going to be told you're, you're good. You're keep going. Or if you're not, you're going to get a little course correction from it, but it's going to do it in a nice warm way. And, uh, so I, I would recommend that for people that say, I like the idea of DMT, but it sounds really scary to me. Then do Bufo. Cause it's, it's got the DMT feeling where it comes on super fast. You smoke it and it comes on and it's a good 10 minute trip. But I, I did the combo with that, which was lay, you know, close my eyes and lay back and do all that. And you get the very, you know, in your ears, you get all that, like, just like you get with DMT and you get the geometrical shapes and everything. But then as it started to kind of, as I went through the most, intense parts and once i knew that was over i then sat up and opened my eyes to look around and i was on the beach as the sun was going down and i was watching um a wedding that was happening right on the beach like right kind of maybe a 50 yards kind of in front of us and i was like whoa those people are getting married wow that's a that's what a beautiful ceremony, you know? And I, and, and then Bearheart says to me, I've, I'm getting a very strong feeling that you want to go again. And I was like, as a matter of fact, I do. So then he said, okay, now this one, hang on. I was like, okay. So I was already seated. I was already sitting up at this point. He got it ready for me. I was still watching this wedding And then this next hit, that one put me on my ass. That one I laid back and it was like, boom, boom, boom. I mean, the, 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 the echoing was ramping up and the colors were getting brighter and faster. I still had that same kind of feeling that something was scanning me Hmm. again, but it, but I'm not too surprised because it had, it has that DMT feel to it. Um, and when you got, when I got done with that one, you know, it, it eases out. It's so, it's so crazy how your body has so much practice processing and synthesizing DMT because it's in us. It's in all of us. The, the, the difference that most people go, oh, you're smoking this foreign substance. DMT is in, in you already. It's mm-hmm. in all of us. The, the difference is that there's other components in your body that nullify it before it has this psychoactive effect on you. So your body's great at processing it. That's why you don't get sick smoking it either. If I eat mushrooms, I throw up. Like my body has no experience with that. My body's very good at processing DMT. Everybody's is. And so when it wears off, you're like back to normal. You're like back to baseline in like 30 minutes. You're totally fine. 
like I could have taken a test or driven a car. I remember after with the DMT ceremony where I saw like the grid, I went back to Max Egan's bar and had a cheeseburger and a beer afterwards. You know what I mean? I was like, I'm starving. Let's go. You know? So like you, you would be surprised. Like, you know, there's no, it's not like alcohol where it's like you're drunk for hours and then it eventually wears off and you get tired and go to bed or weed where you're like, Oh, I'm still kind of high all day, you know, whatever. When it's over, it's over. You're like hmm. totally back to a base. I mean, your world is turned upside down, of course, but 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 it, in terms of your interactions with other people, nobody would know. That's so, interesting. I, so that's an Arcapulco. Yeah. I always like to go and do that. And, and I don't, you know, the first two years, it was in like an a closed environment, you know, with their shaman and everything. The, the, the Johnny dollar on the beach story that was, we kind of went rogue and did that on our own. Then the, the last time this, this last time, which was like a month ago, the Bufo thing, that was also same thing sanctioned by an Arcapulco with their shaman who, um, you know, I mean, I knew, I knew the first shaman too, through, through Berwick. And, and then the second guy I'd met the year before and saw him again, this year and you know he remembered me i remembered him and we you know and then we went swimming you know I, like when it's all over it's like what were we gonna do like, i'm gonna go he's like you should go swimming and then jump in a cab and go back to the event because we're at some like holistic place like on the beach like 10 kilometers away so so you got to really want it you got to really want to do it and if you, but if you are, if you're somebody that's ready for that stuff, I mean, it'll, it'll just, it'll show you a different perspective. And, and, and it, I think there's value in that. And, and I know that it's like, you know, you're, you're doing drugs or, you know, drugs bad, okay, you know, and all that stuff. And it's like, yeah, for sure. There are some that are really horrible for you that, that strip you of your soul and, and all your money and your, sanity and your rationality and your family and those, i have never had any interest in those at all. no there's just i don't i don't like that but if you're somebody that is a little bit more interested in the fringes and if you're listening watching whatever stuff like this then you are then i think in the right situation in the right setting when you're ready for it under the right conditions uh it, it can be very helpful. It can be very helpful for some people. I had the mm -hmm. first DMT session I did with Johnny Dollar back in 2019, where we got partnered up randomly. He went first and then I went second. When I went second, there was a lady that was doing, you know, cause we were in a big group. There was a lady that had just, uh, they just blown it up her nose. Right. And she was just started sobbing uncontrollably mm -hmm. like, Ooh! you know like and i was like okay well she's working on some some real shit here and i thought maybe five minutes she'd be good but it went on for 20 minutes with her like i finally had to get up i was supposed to be tripping my ass off and i wasn't because i was so distracted by this lady next to me that was just wailing that i got up pulled my blindfold off and said to the shaman like i need to move to the other side of this room like as far away from her as possible so you you have to have the right setting. Mm -hmm. And 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 if you are somebody that is working through something, like I think that lady that was crying was probably felt way better afterwards. She was unpacking some serious things that needed help. And um for people out there that are hurting or have some trauma that is unhealed, this is an option for them, you know, and it's not to be taken lightly. It's not to be like you know, I'm going to go smoke DMT at Coachella or something like, ah, oh, the idea of that just sounds so unappealing to me. But, but if you're in the right place and you're with the right people and you have the right intention and you, and you're respectful of it and you're not screwing around, it can be life-changing, you know? And for a lot of people that have, you know, and of course there, there's the tendency to be like, you know, to the, the Rogan stuff, it's like, you know, Hey, have you, if you smoke DMT, you know, and like it's, it turns into kind of like a punchline of a joke and everything. And that's fine. And it's funny and, and I get it, but, but there's a real 
power inside of that. And for people that have done it and people that have experienced it, you're not likely to forget it. That's for sure. And, and, and you might, you just might feel like things are better. I remember the first time I did mushrooms, I was a freshman in college and um, I have a very open relationship with my mom where I would just tell her all kinds of things. And I told her that I had done mushrooms. And I also told her something that she didn't believe at the time. And it wasn't until I was able 25 years later to dunk on my mom and finally send her the article. But I remember saying to her, I feel so much better. Like the days afterwards, I just feel better. And then I found the study that showed that psilocybin mushrooms helped reconnect neural pathways that mm -hmm. have been disconnected just during life, that they showed like a PET scan of a person's brain before and after. And they showed that it was lit up afterwards, yeah. all these connections that hadn't been lit up before. And I was like, look, they're doing amazing work on that. And I'm no, you know, I have my problems with the medical industry for sure. But, but this was kind of proving my point, like there's something here. There is something here. It's getting dis it's getting hidden and dismissed as being drugs and it's being put mm -hmm. on a schedule and they're putting people in prison for it. But this is something that is has some kind of benefit. And it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't want you doing it, not because it was dangerous, because God knows that your government doesn't it doesn't care, you know, if right. you're gonna jump out of a third story window and thinking you could fly or anything like that. Well, your they're government would that. prefer that you smoke crack. For sure. They would definitely prefer you smoke crack. What they don't want you to know is they don't want you to know that like what Terrence McKenna said, that like dr that psychedelics open you up to the possibility that everything that you know is wrong. And and that they can't have spent too much time crafting this reality to allow you anywhere near that. Because if you were near that, you would understand the scam. You would see these things. And, I, and I'll tell you, and I haven't done any sort of like actual polling or anything like this with people in our little world. But my guess would be the people like us that do podcasts about this stuff or write books or make documentary series. My guess would, would be a very, very high percentage of people that have tried psych psychedelics that, un that, that, mm -hmm. that psychedelics open you up not to smoking crack cocaine. They open you up to Bill Cooper, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which might even be worse, depending on uh, as far as from the government. <laughs> like you said, the government would, would prefer you smoking cocaine than listening to Bill Cooper or reading his books. So like, but the psychedelics open you up to this idea that maybe everything's a little different than what you think it is. And and so I can understand why they would view that as a threat. And of course they do. And so uh, whenever I get a chance to peek behind the curtain, I like to try and do it. So that's, yeah. So you asked about my crazy trip. That's my crazy trip. Well, you know, hats Simulation. off to you for having the courage to be able to do that. Because again, like you say, a lot of people would just shy away from it because they think it's a drug. And that it's not yeah. going to provide them anything beneficial to begin with. I think that just illustrates uh, how you, it, it's probably a good example of how you go about things generally in your life. Instead of listening to what other people are telling you about something, you want to find out for yourself. You want to be able to verify on your own whether or not what people are telling you is accurate. And I commend you for that because... I think that's the attitude that everyone should have. Well, thank you. I do recognize that like the stove is hot. You don't have to put your hand on it. You know, there's some things that I don't necessarily need to test out. But when it comes to the the psychedelic side of things, that is that is one that I I most definitely needed to experience for myself. Um, but I fully recognize that not, it's not, it's not right for everybody. Not everybody is sort of ready for that. They're not as equipped for it. Definitely start off small, be very careful, be respectful of it too. Like, like when, when you start to hear about, you know, ayahuasca and how it's, how it came to be that the, the, the 
leaves from one plant and the root from another plant and you brew them together and for three days in a certain specific way. And there's 125,000 different varieties of plants and roots in the Amazon and how they got this thing right. And I remember, I remember being there and, and being in the middle of an ayahuasca trip and thinking to my, and thinking about that. Like when they asked the shaman, how did you figure this out? His response was the jungle told us how to do it. Now, when you hear that in like a sober state, state of mind, you're like, get out of here with that. But I remember thinking, of course, how else would you know this? The jungle would have to tell you. Now, I don't know how the jungle told these people, but, but when you've got a head full of ayahuasca and you're trying to understand that the jungle is communicating with people and doing different things, surprisingly makes a hell of a lot of sense when you have a head full of ayahuasca. You're like, yes, I know that sounds crazy, but it could probably work. It might actually be less crazy than I than I thought it it, it was. And so, you know, some of this stuff, you just, you just do the calculation. You go, I feel like we're supposed to know this. Mm. I feel like we're supposed to do this. And, and, and the shaman that I talked to is saying that like in their tribe, like the children are given ayahuasca when they're babies. Oh, they're wow. given small amounts of it. They want to never sever their connection to the spirit. They want to make sure that they, they never get scared of it and that they never um, lose that connection. So they give it to them early. And I was like, oh. I mean, you got to be in the right society to 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 do something like that. I don't, or or maybe 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 every society needs some of that. I don't know. I I, I always kind of leave those 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 trips feeling like like this might solve some of the problems, but not everybody is ready for this. Right. You know, this is, you can't just throw somebody into ayahuasca all at once or dmt it's just it's too much well especially you have to be be curious in this day and age where we have people whose psyches have been deliberately fractured by things like government and media um throwing something like that on somebody that's not ready for it absolutely you're you're asking for trouble yeah yeah yeah, you got to build up to it. But for those that are ready and those that that think that there might be some value there, I would say don't get hung up on the labels that the government puts yeah. on it because they're awful and they're never to be trusted. But but if you find a situation where you're able to experience something like that. Oh, and by the way, in the ayahuasca ceremony that I was in, there were maybe 40 people in it at least half of the people were 65 and older. Hmm. That's interesting. So, yeah. I, I wasn't expecting that. And that's the reason why I brought it up was because I, I there was this in my mind, it was going to be like a parking lot at a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> you know, it was going to be a bunch of 20 somethings in there. And I got in there and I was like, Okay. So well, like a, maybe it was like a parking lot. Audience. Yeah, maybe it was like a parking lot at a Grateful Dead concert just, you know, like 40 years ago. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that could be it. These are the people, they were at the, at the original. That's right. Uh, they, yeah. they got the party Shoreline started, show. so to speak. Yeah. Well, yeah, Charlie, yeah. you have been incredibly gracious uh, with your time with us today. And uh, we do appreciate it. I thank you very much for uh, taking the time yeah. to sit down and have this conversation with us. I'm about to let you off the hot seat. But uh, before I do, let everybody know how they can connect with your work. Got a brand new website, macroaggressions.io. That's the place to go. You can find information about the books and um, the Union of the Unwanted podcast, and Day Zero podcast. We have fun on that one. If I ever get kicked off the internet, it'll be because of Day Zero. I'm telling you, I already know that. We just talk about the craziest things there. Um, so that's a good place to to 
find information about me. Uh, Macroaggressions podcast goes out twice a week, once on Wednesdays as a monologue and once on Sundays as an interview. I've got uh, um, Michael Cobb from ECI Development on this week. He's uh, he's the first real estate developer to take crypto for his projects. And I've got John Perkins, speaking of John Perkins, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. He'll be on uh, next Sunday back again. Oh, and, nice. Um, yeah, so we'll see. He invited me to go to the Amazon with him. So I might have to do that. So if I'm gone for a couple of weeks or if I never come back, you'll know, you'll know where I was. I went, well, I was going to say, uh, if you, if you take him Amazon. up on it, come back and, uh, and tell us some of the stories. That would be awesome. I know. I, I think I, I, I'm tempted to do it. If I can do it, if I can fit it in my schedule, I definitely will make time to do that. I mean, because if I look back on things, I've got to be honest, in 2007, I read his book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and the light bulb went off in my head as to the money side of things. And so for those, for people that are, that like the government conspiracies, but aren't really sure how all the money works, Confessions of an Economic Hitman is, is to me, was the, was the key that that unlocked a huge part of this. And um, for me, years later, to have uh, sort of uh, developed this kind of relationship with, with John has been uh, a trip for me, <laughs> a real trip, because, because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for John Perkins and David Icke and these people that have sort of written these books that, that explained a lot to me when I was having a hard time figuring out how these things fit together, they provided a couple pieces of the puzzle that I didn't, I didn't know about. And it made it much easier for me to, to understand things. And hopefully, hopefully one day, uh, some people will, will, will write books and they'll say that the octopus of global control helped them understand things the way that John Perkins book helped me or the David Icke's books helped me or Graham Hancock's or, or, or all the ones that I read that laid this out in a way. So um, I'm building off of their work and hopefully someone will build off of my work and then someone else will build off of their work. But there's, there's plenty of uh, there's plenty left to be written about this. And, um, and I appreciate you having me on. So thanks for thinking of me. Well, absolutely. I mean, it just from my point of view, I first uh, was turned on to macroaggressions by a friend of mine back in 2021. Uh, and I'll, I'll be completely honest and admit that I don't listen to every single episode of the show because I have no, you know this does. huge menu of media that I try to consume each and every week. Uh, yeah. But macroaggressions is on that menu. You know, so I, I probably listen to more episodes than I don't listen to, but it has helped fill in a lot of the gaps in my knowledge personally, which was why I felt it was important to have you on the show and have this discussion with you so that other people could get some exposure to you and, you know, get a better idea of where you're coming from. I, I appreciate it. I, there's plenty of room for everyone and 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 you don't have to agree with everything I say. Uh, that's cool. That's not required. And you don't have to be interested in all the topics I talk about. Again, if you find somebody like if you find a, a someone that I'm interviewing and you go, oh, listen to them, listen to the John Perkins interview. He's great, of course, because we're talking about we talk about South America, and that's where he was an economic hitman, and he's talking about the Chinese coming in and doing what he used to do, but they're doing it differently. Some parts better for the country, some parts not better for the country. But it's interesting to hear from him. And he was a guy that was a bad guy for a while, long time, he, for a decade. He was, he was the bad guy. And then he realized he didn't know he was the bad guy. Then he had this epiphany. Then he stayed working as the bad guy for a couple of years until he was able to pry himself away from it. And then eventually wrote this book as sort of like a, I need to absolve myself of the things that I've done. And now he's like a hardcore uh, environmentalist who's out there trying to like save the rainforest and everything. So that's well, ladies funny, and gentlemen, how these things work. Uh, this has been the Charlie Robinson interview 
on Liberty Radio. Go out and uh, find him at macroaggressions.io and you better start listening to his podcast if you haven't been doing so already. Lots of good stuff in there. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, you are now